Yeah, I have a big giant pair of boots back there. And like, I just decided today, I was like, okay, if I have to wear big giant boots, then I'm also gonna make sure I have slippers in the office. This man knows his winter. I'm built for comfort, not for speed. Hello everyone, I am Sasha Claire Vazian. Welcome back to Music, Movies, and Hoops interviews. I'm stoked to be wearing this MMH hat for the first time. Our online store will be up soon. In the meantime, if you would like your own MMH swag, hit us up on social media. I'm even more excited to be joined today by the acclaimed Austin Music award-winning singer-songwriter, steel guitar maestro, and really the pride of Vancouver Island, Mr. Jeff Plankenhorn. Good to see you. How are you today? Sasha, I'm doing great, man. It's nice to see you too and to be able to talk virtually i feel like i'm right there with you you walk to the studio in the snow but now you're slippered and cozy yes the uh, uh here on vancouver island surprisingly enough even though it's canada we had our first snow a day and a half ago oh wow and uh i mean there's plenty of snow on the island but here in campbell river um we're so close to the water and the mountains are up a little bit from us and so we have had lots and lots of rain but no snow um, and so we got a really, really nice snow and I had to put on the heavy boots to get in to the office today, which is only about a seven minute walk from our, our house. But I am prepared with my, my good slippers to have a fulfilling day in the office of music and, uh, and things like this. Fantastic. Well, I want to put you on the hot seat right away. Is that okay, Jeff? I don't think I have a choice, but I'm okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So you just on Friday released your first single of the year, Murder of Crows. Congratulations. It's a song I love. I would love if you could play it for us live. Would you be open to sure. that? Thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, let me make sure I'm in the right tuning and I'll... Yeah, I'm already set for the... Even in the right tuning, you don't even have to wait for that. That's good, good luck right there. So uh, this song was basically inspired by a chance encounter with some unlikely crows, not where you would expect them. And then they just started following me and it was kind of kind of creepy, but kind of cool at the same time. And then I took this song to my friend Gabriel Rhodes and he played this fantastic line on acoustic guitar and sent it to me. And um, I liked it so much, I tried to recreate it in the studio. It's sort of like a... But it didn't really work really well on slide. So we actually took the iPhone recording of him playing it because I couldn't get the groove like him. Mm -hmm. And that's what starts the song, the actual iPhone recording. But I'm gonna do my best to do like a, a, a nice solo version of it for you. Thanks for asking. <laughs> in a hurricane Sun has got a soul to say But he learns that tone is heavy Lies run faster than the truth Sees three thieves on the highway About to throw the tar right off the roof Which 
perto de tell you and i'm not just saying this gave me chills really did. oh cool no i really mean well, that and and thanks, man. one thing that we all miss the most about live music is when you connect with somebody live you're in a room with them a listening room or a house concert it really is affecting it really is powerful you feel something kinetic something electric and somehow man through these airwaves from vancouver island to austin i got some of that in that performance it really it really connected thank you thank you for what you're saying you know i got to tell you one thing real quick too mm -hmm. um it's something that came up on on my my 20 question shows which is a thing that i do on tuesdays where i, I bring somebody on like yourself and we talk and we we take uh questions from the audience and um a lot of times people will say something like what's it like being on like a big stage versus being on like a small stage and I honestly, you know, somehow um, came across this answer because it's true. And whether I'm on Zoom or, or uh, uh, some sort of platform or I'm doing my live streams or I'm on a stage, big or small, the feeling that you get when you are at a show and you're connecting with the person who's on stage, if I go to a Stevie Wonder show, I'm so in the zone with everybody who's around me. And I'm so connected. And the same thing if I'm seeing somebody new at like an open mic and they're just freaking me out. I feel this kind of sense of connection. And that feeling is almost exactly what it feels like to play and almost exactly what it feels like to be on stage. So that has really kind of told me something over the years about mm. how mm. it really, really is about connection. And the more I take myself out of it, mm -hmm. the better I do. Yeah. I mean, I think I got to tell the story now. Speaking of Stevie Wonder, uh, oh, you, just I'm ready. Brought, you just brought him up. So he was a speaker. Um, when I graduated college, they, they wow. brought him out and gave him an honorary award. Yeah. And what he said, Plank, that I think about to this day all the time was they said, hey, Mr. Wonder, thank you for your amazing contribution to American music. We're so thrilled to give you this honorary award or honorary degree. And he got on the mic and he's like, yeah. I, you know, I'm just so grateful that God chose me to be a conduit for this music and let share it with everybody and everyone gets to have it. I'm just so grateful. And he simultaneously in like one sentence honored that he has written some of the best songs of all time and they're really important and they're basically perfect and didn't take any credit for that. <laughs> and, this, you know, yeah. what, to what you just said about taking yourself out of it and, he, you know, just being this idea of being a conduit. Do you feel like when 
I want to talk about songwriting. I think this is a great segue. Do you feel like when you're writing, do you think you're at your best when your ego is out of it and you're just letting music flow out of you? You know, analogous to a sculptor taking a big, big chunk and just chipping away the stuff until it becomes a sculpture. That's one analogy I really, really like. Because I think there's just like so many songs yet to be written, even though so many songs have been written. Yeah. There's like this never endless supply of them. And I feel like uh, uh, those of us that are good at it, we work at our craft and that's super, super, super important. However you do that, whether mm -hmm. it's just writing songs a ton or you're the kind of person who really wants to understand theory or you're the kind of person who like listens to the top 10 pop songs every week to get ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, all of those things are valid depending mm -hmm. on what you want to do. But a lot of times it's just like uh, pulling it out of the ether. You know, and it's there and it's waiting for you. And it's not like I had any free will when the idea came into my head. It just came into my head. I didn't think to myself, I'm going to think about how I'm going to write a song about. Mer no, it's just it's just popped in there somehow. So so uh, uh, you can't it's kind of hard to take complete credit for it. You can take credit for doing a good job. You know, um, and there's another story that I tell a lot that I love. This was a short one, though, where uh, the woman who wrote uh, Eat, Pray, Love, I often forget her name, and she's a great, great, great educator about the creative process. And she tells a story of interviewing Tom Waits. And Tom Waits says, I'm driving on the L.A. freeway and it's packed. And I get this wonderful idea for a song in my head and I'm in gridlock and I'm looking around. I don't have a phone to sing into. I don't have a recorder. I have nothing. I'm perfectly stopped. I have nothing to write this little idea for a song on. It's beautiful in my head. And finally, I just looked up at the ceiling and I said, can't you see I'm driving? You know, and I think that's that's it. Yeah, well said. So let's talk about writing Murder of Crows. Sure. Um, Before you go any further, Jeff, that amazing instrument you played, I'm not sure everybody's hip to it. Can you tell us about yes. what you got there? Um, for years, I used to play dobro in mm. like bluegrass bands. Now, the dobro is the one that's got the hubcap in it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're played guitar style, but they also have a square neck that is to be played with really, really high action so that you put a slide on the strings and you just lay it down. <laughs> And then you tune it to an open chord so that you can. But then when you play weird chords, you have to use some sort of an, uh, like if I play a minor chord, I've got to use some strange combination of strings or I've got to skip strings. Can't really tell if that's major or minor unless I play this. And then it's a D minor. Then it's a D major. So this, though, um, I started playing. Uh, I, I designed my own instrument that's called the plank, and it's uh, it's like that. But I I wanted to be able to play in rock bands with distortion and big amps, and they sounded ridiculous. So then I had that designed, and I sold them for a couple of years to a couple of great players. But mainly, that business is really really hard. So I started playing Weisenborn. I was sitting down all the time and I would go to these shows and I'd be the only person sitting down. And I know it's a fun gimmick, but I didn't, I didn't want to sit down. Mm. So about three years ago, I found this, which is, yeah. an Oahu, it's an Oahu student model, <laughs> 1940s, no fancy at all. And I put a nice pickup in it and it holds a couple of different tunings where I can put a power cord on the bottom. Yeah. Because if I don't if I don't have a bass player there, then I want to be to, you know, so I use mostly uh, low G and, and D tuning and really works for me. What I love about it is I don't care how good your songs are. Well, that's not true. If, if you're Bob Dylan or or Paul McCartney, I can listen for hours. But generally, if you're just a dude with the guitar, even if you have fantastic songs, when it gets to song eight of you strumming and singing. It can, it can get a little rough. What I loved about the Murder of Crows performance is you're playing rhythm for yourself, accompanying, singing, and playing lead for yourself. And it's fantastic, and it's really stimulating orally. Was that part of the intention? Well, I think that, that trying to make the show interesting, I have a really, really, really good friend who is an amazing guitar player, songwriter, and singer. He's good at all three. 
And he came to me once and he said, you know, how come so-and-so who just came to town is doing so well, you know, when I've been working at it. And I was like, you're a white guy with a strat, you know? And I mean, like, honestly, man, like we got a lot of that, you know, I was like, I was like, think, I mean, and I, I kept encouraging him because he was so, so good at playing like soul tunes on his acoustic. Mm -hmm. You play like neo soul jazz chords. And like, I literally got a club I knew to hire him as a solo acoustic guy and said, no, no, no. But I mean, I was kind of forcing it on him. It was just, it's just what I love to hear him do. But my point is, um, you know, doing something to, to make yourself a little bit different is not necessarily gimmicky. Mm. It was kind of the sounds that I heard in my head. And then I just want to make it a good show. Like then I want to make it like full. I don't want to to feel like, like I know that sometimes when I'm playing specifically, like uh, when I'm playing the chorus and I want to put a lick in, sometimes the bottom falls out. You know, I would go, tell the truth till it bleeds. And then there's a spot and I'd go. Okay, well, when I do that, there's no more. That's gone. So correct. It makes it a little bit. Uh, it makes it difficult. It makes it sloppy. It makes it. But but it's there's a way to do it. You just you just do your best. And you try and work it out. One of the other things I think that's great about Austin and tough about Austin mm. is that we like to improvise, <laughs> and we love to just play a song nobody's heard, and we love to. And our crowds in Austin love that right when we go somewhere else and we play on stage and we do that people go i can't believe i paid 20 bucks to see this guy rehearse right right gotta not do it so jeff let's pop the trunk let's go to songwriter corner for a minute here so with murder of crows you had this story and then you just sent the story to your friend gabriel or you had some music it's funny because the riff came from him and I literally don't know how to play it with his groove. It's just that, you know? Awesome. But it's kind of bluegrassy, but it's a little bit more down and dirty Bluesy. than that. Great lick. It's a really, really cool lick. It's even cooler when he does it. Yeah. Um, it just has a little bit more pocket. I remember being in the studio. He wasn't there. I tried to do it. I even called him. And then I was like, please just send it to me so I can give it a shot. So then he sent me the idea. And I was like, I was like, can we just use the iPhone thing? And they're like, yeah, it'll sound cool. We'll just make it sound kind of. That's so cool. Telephone. That's music so at just its best. But when we got on um, uh, to actually writing the song song, which was before that, of course, you know, I started throwing out lines about this character who was kind of me, who was in the woods, who was getting followed by crows. When somebody says, like, uh, somebody's seeking oblivion, that's generally a, a cue for somebody who's an addict, you know? Sure. And so Sonny Seeks Oblivion, you know, is most likely somebody who's had some troubles that may be of his own doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I remember saying the line, picking up nickels in a hurricane to Gabe. And he said, what's, what, what's that? And I said, he's like, shouldn't it be like picking up cans? Like, why would he be picking up nickels? And I was like, well, no, it's, it's, it's harder. I said, imagine trying to pick up nickels in a hurricane. And he goes, huh. And then I said, what almost never fails if I'm songwriting and co-writing with somebody, I said, it just sounds like something Tom Waits would say. Oh, well, that's the move. And as soon as I said that, he goes, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> I love that. He's like, if you say that, then, then of course I'm going to put it in. And it does, because Tom Waits is somebody who like, would throw in an image like, meet me at the knuckles of the skinny bone tree. You Great know? line. Isn't it? Doesn't that, I mean, you see everything. This person is going to go meet somebody. Why don't you meet me at the knuckles of the skinny bone tree? You see it. Totally. So you have this first, you talked about how that came together. Then it goes to this kind of major soaring chorus. It feels like there's this real lift, which is really apropos because it's a song about crows. 
Where'd the chorus come from? I love the chorus. Man, I just started banging out chords. I heard the switch to the B flat in my head. Okay. Um, and because you know we're in a we're in a verse where he learns that Tony's heavy lines run faster than the truth. Sees three thieves on a highway, about to blow the tar right off the roof. Beauty shallow, tell the truth till it bleeds. So beauty shallow is um, a term from a David Byrne book that I read. He likes to think that uh, he used to call beauty shallow was like ugly music that's beautiful. And so uh, I, I always liked that term, like beauty shallow, like beauty doesn't have to be deep for it to be awesome. Beauty can be like, and I thought that this guy would dig that. And then I think he wants to tell himself the truth. So I, I don't know where I got that from, but I know that that's from something else. Tell the truth till it bleeds. Black feather shadow, tell me what you see. He's looking into a crow, you know, murder a crows is flying with me. And he doesn't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. I like those lines. So for the theory heads out there, you, the verse is in G. Yep. And then the chorus is really an F. Um, yeah. And... I mean, really, it's B flat, F, C, G. Yeah. It's an F with a, with a G chord. But um, really nice. You go to you go down a step, but then you start with the four chord of the new key, which masks a little more. You might want to think of it more air. in C. You might think of it more in C, because it hangs on the C for the tell the truth to the bees. A murder of crows flies with me, and then you change back to the G. Yeah, you know, there's no five of fives in this, which I really like. I mean, like like or the the it's more like B flat F C G. As opposed to something that goes, you know, with a bunch of two fives. It's it's yeah. darker that way. It's, yeah. it's fifth fifthier and darker. And then to go to the solo, you know, we're kind of hanging out. And I was like, uh, and I go to E flat and I just do the chorus in a different key because why? Oh, pro move. I don't know. I don't know if it's a pro move or not. I've never done it in a song before. No, Beach Boys purpose, do that. I remember. Do they? Yeah. I don't know. Perfect. I think that a lot of times we think too much about theory. I'm someone who knows a lot of, a fair amount of theory mm -hmm. and will use it. Um, but I think a lot of times the best thing is to keep putting your hands down until you find something that sounds right. Mm -hmm. I use it more as a tool to communicate with people than I do to come up with ideas. I like to think of theory as like a way out, not a way in, you know? I always like that. Yeah, you know, like theory's great when you're stuck and you don't know what chord to go to and there's like, oh, I could go to the four, I could borrow from this neighboring key. It When you go in and the first thing you think is like, I'm gonna use a secondary dominant and I'm gonna you use are, a flagrant cadence. Kind of, it's kind of like, You already well, kind of shot yourself in the foot. Yeah, right? well, are, are you? you? I mean. Yeah. You have anything prefer, to say about it? If I have an analogy I like to make, I like yeah. to think of it as grammar. Okay. Because when, when I'm talking to you right now, the last thing that I am thinking at all is noun, verb, adjective, clause, none of it. Mm -hmm. That's that's already there. I've already learned that to complete the sentences. And I never had to learn it because there's plenty of people who never learn that stuff that can communicate just fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I'm not going noun, verb, adjective, then I'm also not going. I'm not thinking Ooh. about those. All I'm right, not Jazz thinking Town. about what, but you know what I mean though? It's like, if I think about it, I'm screwed. Right. You can't, like, I can't play a whole bunch of changes and be thinking about them as I go. Other cats can do that. Some I'm people can. Like, um, when I'm teaching a lesson, especially about guitar playing, I'm really, really, really fond of making people sing everything they play. I don't care if they've got a voice or not, but if you can't sing it, there's a good chance you should not play it because you don't know what you're playing. If I play, then I should be able to go. Otherwise, I don't know what I'm playing and I'm playing too much. You know, and the other thing that's great about singing and playing is 
you take breaths. Mm. You have to pause. You, you learn from vocalists and from horn players, you know, where the space goes. It's true if I'm playing a bluegrass run and it's really driving. Uh, that, that's supposed to do this. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to plug along, mm -hmm. you know. Flat but, if I'm but if I'm playing a song for song's sake and somebody says, take a ride, First place I'll start's the melody and and really, really try and sing when I play. We've gone all over the place from what we were talking about, but that's okay. It's yeah, that's fault. fantastic. No, it's fantastic. Jeff, I got a question for you and I wonder what your answer is. Could you name your favorite song that you've ever written? Do you have that in your mind? No, you know, I really don't. The, the first song that comes to mind is a, is a song that I wrote that I never play anymore, but I wrote when I was really, really young, and it kind of opened me up to the idea that I might be a good songwriter. Will you play it but for us? I, I could play you a little bit of it. Awesome. Um, I had been given a book by my girlfriend at the time by John Cabot Zinn, and it was called Wherever You Go, There You Are. And it was like, somebody was like, the, the gal was looking out for me because I was just so tortured and anxious. And, and I was in a new grass band and we played lots of stuff and we went to Telluride and took second in the competition. And, wow. And, uh, and I, was, I was playing Dobro. I'd only been playing Dobro for about a year. But I had written something that was in like 5-4 because I was also a big fan of Soundgarden at the time. And it's like this. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. Five. Totally feel that. So that's kind of how the verses work. Pretty and cool, the, the five, man. Yeah, and the bridge, cool. there's like a bridge and it goes, but I can feel it pulling me down again. So I might as well dive in. And then I would do another couple of verses and then I would do that bridge again, but the chorus was uh, wherever So Plank, I'm sure all your best songs have a unique quality that makes them great. A great lyric, a great riff, whatever that may be. I'm looking for commonalities. Do you think that there's any shared characteristic that your best music has? Yeah, I do, honestly. Great. Um, if, if I think there's, I, I do, honestly, uh, if there's anything for me, it kind of goes back to what we were talking to earlier. First of all, I don't think that highly of myself to sit around and and kind of think of the best songs or, or I don't want it to appear like that. But for me with the connection, like I saw really early on how music would help people. Mm. And uh, I like songs. If I talk about how Stevie Wonder is like my big, you know, guy, it's not just because I'm a fan of the harmonica. It's not because that was the music that I listened to when I would lay in front of the speaker when I was a child that made me want to play music. It was also the fact that everyone has a seat at the table when they come and they listen to Stevie Wonder. Everyone. Doesn't matter religion, doesn't matter race, doesn't matter anything. And I know that may seem a little bit um, cliche to say these days, but that's been my MO since I started. Everyone has a seat at the table or it's 
not as good as it can be, in my opinion. Uh, it, just meaning that they can either put them, I, I try to write songs that everybody can put them into or that you can't argue with, you know, like try and try and argue with me that love is love. After the Pulse nightclub shooting, Lin-Manuel Miranda gave a speech at the Tony Awards and it went viral. And he recited this poem, and at the end of it, he just kept saying, love is love is love is love is love. Until they're finished songs and start to play. When senseless acts of tragedy remind us that nothing here is promised. Not one day. The show is proof that history remembers. We live through times when hate and fear seem stronger. We rise and fall and light from dying embers. Remembrances that hope and love last longer. And love is 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 love, is love <laughs> cannot be killed or swept aside. And you could see as they went around with the camera on everybody's faces how affected they were. And I was like, you know, all the old hippies used to say that when I was a kid. It's a shame that we still have to say that. But wouldn't it be great if I could put it in a song and we could all sing it together? Patty Griffin says something really interesting about songwriting. I think, I think she said in an interview, I'm sure I'm going to misquote, but close. You don't know what's going to happen when you put a song out there. It's not really yours anymore once it's out. Mm -hmm. Once it's out, it's going to have kind of a life of its own. And it's going to surprise you sometimes. That song has surprised me. Another person came up and said, I'm going to talk to my daughter. I haven't talked to her in 10 years, you know, because I heard that song. I didn't, I didn't understand. I was so flabbergasted by what he was saying. It took me like an hour after the show to realize it was because his daughter had come out and he wasn't into it. Man, this is so beautiful. Can we close this part of the conversation with you sharing Love is Love with us? Sure. Uh, I do an okay solo version of it. So beautiful. I'd be happy to do that. Awesome. Take a seat. 
seat at the table Break some bread, make a new friend In time you'll find forgiveness and kindness Is all you ever needed messed up once quick shout out i want to give for the songwriters out there great technique you use in that song you have the verse riff and then the chorus you use the riff as like a tag so you sing over it in the verse but then it's like a response in the chorus that's such a great technique to get the most mileage out of your harmonic information love that huh you know um uh thank you learning at my age to finally learn to take compliments uh one thing i love <laughs> One thing I love about that song is um, my, is how my wife came into it. I started writing the chorus. I wanted the chorus to only be those words repeated like the end of his poem. Um, so I'm playing this stuff and I'm kind of trying the chorus out. And I know it's going to be kind of long with a... Uh, like I could just hear it going there. And I said, honey, I got two versions of the chorus I really like. And she said, what are they? And I said, one's love is love is love. said that's nice and i said here's the other one love love is love is love is love I said it's a little bit more beatly love is love is love and she just quickly without thinking remember she's not a musician she's a horticulturalist she goes well why don't you just use both and Bing. i said huh okay so uh uh Oh, well, then I could use like the first for the first two choruses and the second chorus, I could extend it and use the one that's got more changes. I heard that and it was a nice change. And my wife just goes mm -hmm, and walks away. Jeff, I'm hoping you'll indulge me by closing with a pretty zany lightning round. Are you open to get a little bit weird over here? Sure. Why not? Person you would most like to write with, co-write with, alive or dead. Tom Waits. Person you would most like to get on stage and play a gig with, alive or dead? Stevie Wonder. What musical skill do you wish you most had? All of them. <laughs> Brad Pitt or Leonardo DiCaprio? Why choose? Led Zeppelin or the Beatles? You have to choose. The Beatles. Most people are Beatles or Elvis, you know? Mm. Uh, so I was surprised when you said uh, Zeppelin. And I, I love the rock, but Beatles were first, so I have to pick them. Yeah. Are, are you Beatles over Stones? Mm -hmm. I mean, here's the thing. If I have to choose, probably Beatles, but it's, it's such a different thing. I'm not looking for the same thing when I grab a record. Michael Jordan or LeBron? Ooh, toughest one yet. After we're done, I'm going to talk to you about this. Okay. LeBron. <laughs> okay, we, we got to hear your 30-second take on this. This is MMH here. I was, uh, uh, I used to work at the Palace of Auburn Hills okay. during during the Dream Team days. Detroit I would Pistons. Work, I worked with the games, like I would work concessions and come in and watch Isaiah and Microwave, Vinny Johnson and Lamb Beer. And even the short time that Rodman was there, it was a short time. Rodman wasn't there for very long. Isaiah was insane. We were the only team that beat Jordan. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. We were the only one. And I was also 
a freshman in college with the Fab Five at the University oh, of Oh my God, I love the Fab Five. Yeah. And I remember the time, I was watching when the timeout, I wasn't there, but I watching it when the timeout thing happened with Chris Weber. But as far as, uh, I mean, man, it's really, really tough. I, I would, if you would have asked me maybe five years earlier, I'd probably say Jordan all the way. Um, but he's just done so much. Mm. He's just done mm. so much, you know. So, but I'm 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 one of those rare people who doesn't know a lot about sports. But I am one of those people who believes that really, 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 really great athletes are artists. Period. Oh, totally. Yes. I know I don't have to say that to you, but I'm saying it to other people out there. I'm telling you, the 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 stuff that people put in to become a great athlete has a lot of similarities and parallels to somebody who becomes a great artist. A lot. If you question that, go watch uh, Rafael Nadal play tennis. Go yeah, watch go. Steph Curry shoot. I mean, it's beautiful. If you became the music czar of Austin, what is the first thing you'd do? I think the first thing I would do is uh, uh, provide them with a living wage. Fantastic. That's that's what they deserve, and and um, you know it's 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 too hard, you know. I mean, do I think there's too many musicians? Sure, mm -hmm. you know, there's too many that are just doing it because it's fun. They probably shouldn't <laughs> make money, but I'm talking about a living wage. Too, ma too many great musicians have starved. Plank, what's the worst gig you've ever played? It was like a year ago. <laughs> 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 it, was. it was like 20 I, I minutes a, ago a, on a podcast no 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 I, I had a I had a booking coup I, I'm finally starting to get solo gigs you know under my own name and I'm out there and I'm traveling around imagine a Dave and Buster's on steroids <laughs> imagine imagine me with a guitar and a slide on a giant stage with a big screen tv behind me but not just that oh this is perfect there are a giant three car Mario Kart, foosball tables, basketball machines on stage with me. So I would be playing and it'd be like, he scored! You know? <laughs> it was a horrible gig. I even like before the show took a video with my phone and I went around like this with the video and then I sent it to my booking agent. And I said, thanks a lot. <laughs> and uh, I said, this is what I'm doing for you tonight. And uh, he got a laugh because he knew I was, look, I mean, uh, I, I was once with uh, the great Joe Ely and I was backing him up and we showed up in Tulsa and like six people showed up. Now Joe can sell out Tulsa. So somebody messed up. Joe played like it was Carnegie Hall. Mm. He, he gave those six people a show. Love that. And I feel compelled to try my best to do the same, even at Dave and Buster's. Would you rather play a great gig, spend a day at a beachside barbecue, or go to a spa? Mm. I am a person who, I, I'd say spa. <laughs> I was hoping thing. you would say that. <laughs> yeah, because here's the thing, man. Like, uh, uh, I'm the kind of guy who, I didn't get primmed. Like, I, you know, I grew up with not a, a ton of money. And uh, uh, I like being pampered and, and I take advantage of it, even though it weirds me out. Plank, you have a lot of gifts. I'm curious what you would say is your single best gift. Uh, mm. Sobriety. Mm, wow. Wow, that's powerful. Ah, is it? You know, I know it's a bit of a cliche these days, but I really got my life turned around and I'm somebody who just really had some problems. And uh, uh, I got lucky and I had a lot of help and I am writing the best music of my life by far. And that shows by how many people actually dig it. You know, it's a myth. This tor For anybody out there, this, this you have to be a tortured artist is such a Bull. don't mm. believe it don't believe it i just read a great thing about david crosby and he was talking about he's like good god i wish i didn't do that much he was like i spent half my life looped he's like that didn't help me sure you know sure. and i mean like yeah it might open your mind to this or that 
but are you going to have the presence of mind to write it down? <laughs> no. <laughs> Plank, we will link Murder of Crows and put this out. We'll link to your website. But is there anything you'd like to plug or share with folks? Honestly, my favorite thing that I'm doing besides that is patreon.com. Okay. You put five bucks in or whatever per month and you will get new music from me every month. One, mu one month, Hell yeah. you know, one month it's just solo acoustic guitar stuff. The next month I'm writing, you know, piano driven rock tunes, my people on there. I love them so much. I would do anything for them. Well, Plank, listen, man. One positive of the shitty 2020 is is you became a friend to me and, and it's been yeah. so great getting to know you and hang with you and help you develop your music. I so appreciate you sharing your time with us today. Thank you for coming on. I want to say before I go to how grateful I am to you, man. Um, I uh, People who get in my position um, don't often find somebody uh, uh, that will um, get geared up about somebody who's a little bit older and uh, still trying to make it. I just always uh, am really, really impressed musically and otherwise with everything that you're involved with. You know, Plank, if you stick, if you stick around long enough, I think you're going to become a legend. <laughs> You've heard that. <laughs> yes, I have. All right, everybody. Jeff Plank and Hort, thank you so much. <laughs>